Dearly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day that you've given and for the opportunity to study your word. Lord, we live in a world full of strife. And while we know that um, there will continue to be strife as long as um, sin is in this world, we do know that you can give us and will give us a measure of peace. And so help us, Lord, to find peace by following your will, especially as is expressed in your Ten Commandments. Lord, we can't do this on our own. We're weak. Our flesh is weak. Our mind is weak. We, it's impossible for us to do it on our own. But Lord, we know that with you, all things are possible. And you've promised to not only help us, but to change us so that we can keep your law. We know we do this not to be saved, but in order to demonstrate to the world that what salvation looks like. So please guide us and keep us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So how can a person find real peace in today's troubled world? Elder Scorch, would you mind reading it for us, please? Okay, Psalms 119, 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Now, this is a, is a very powerful verse, um, but it's a verse that could be misunderstood especially the second part. The first part, people might wonder or, or might think, okay, they can maybe wrap their minds around it. But the second part about nothing shall offend them. Um, many people may question, how does that actually work? So how would we answer that question? If someone said, what does it mean that nothing shall offend them? Well, it, it depends, I think, on their relationship with Christ and their understanding of what Christ can mean to them, what he can do for them. Yes, that's good. Um, any other thoughts as we continue the discussion? A lot of quiet people, I'm sorry. So, um, so the thought that came to my mind was, when you live in harmony with God's law, so if you look at the world in general, a lot of the friction that we find in the world is because of people disobeying God's law. And when you disobey God's law, it usually um, usually causes friction or problems with other people. Now, someone might challenge that and say, well, um, what if you are worshiping an idol? How is that going to cause a, a conflict with someone else? Well, um, we know that when you follow, when you go outside of God's will, Satan gets involved. In fact, Satan is uh, encouraging you to do so. And when you do that, it causes other problems because Satan always brings problems. Even in, even in the most um, debauched society or parts of society, there's still problems, even though they're all doing what they feel like doing. So, so that may be one way in which um, by following God's law, uh, loving his law, that we'll have that great peace because we won't do things that will cause friction. But even in a world full of sin, you can be doing the right thing and there's still be and problems still come to you. We have plenty of examples in the Bible where the people were doing what they should be doing, and yet other people had problems with them, even though they didn't do anything wrong. You think of Daniel, you can think of um, the three Hebrew worthies, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you can think of Joseph, many others. But as we as, as we love God's law and God's laws in our hearts. Another perhaps um, answer for this is that 
it will carry us above the slights of the ordinary slights of this world. There are people who, um, I remember uh, there was once was a time when if you um, stepped on someone's sneakers, they spent a lot of money on those sneakers. If you did that, um, it can cause a fight, physical fight, not just an argument, a physical fight. Um, some people might even shoot you for it. But when God's love is in our hearts and his law is in our hearts, those types of things don't offend us. So things that may offend other people, we're not as sensitive to, even though, even though it's wrong, we overlook it because we extend that person grace. Yes. But doesn't the law depend on to the extent that people love the law? They can have, they, you know, they, they, can, they say, hey, I love Christ, but their misunderstanding of the law can affect their relationship. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so you know, it's, it's true that, I mean, and that's part of what God is calling us to, is to grow in grace and to learn more. And as we behold, we become changed and we love the law more. Um, one, one definite, one definite indicator as to if, if the changes of God's, of, of the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts is one, how we, how we, how we view the law and how we apply the law. Because if we are among those people who hate the law of God and we, when people talk about the law of God, we suck our teeth and we don't want to even hear it. We say things like, it doesn't matter. We can do whatever you want. Obviously, you're not in a saving relationship with God if you feel that way about his law. Because you know his, his law is a transcript of his character. But even if we love the law, there's some people that love the law, but how they apply the law is not in a righteous manner. So there's some people who are not merciful, who are, they love the letter of the law, but they violate the spirit of the law. So we have to help the Lord, we have to ask the Lord to help us to not only love his law, but also to apply it in a way that will bring honor and glory to his name. So how does the Bible describe God saved people in the last days of earth's history? Dear, would you mind reading this for us, please? Okay. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Very good. So, there are, again, there are some people, there once was a time, and it's, this is very interesting, and I think it's brought out as far as um, how Satan has worked this. Um, but there once was a time when among people who claimed to follow the one true God, um, Jehovah, they would, um, lo uh, his law was something that was revered. But yet the people, like I said before, they say they would love the law, but yet they wouldn't apply the law in a, in a fair and a merciful way. <clears throat> And also, like Christ said of the Pharisees of old, they'll tell you to do all of these things, but they won't even lift those things with their finger. So they were hypocrites. Yeah. And then things have changed um, starting um, right before the Middle Ages. But in the fourth, the fourth and the third um, centuries, um, where it's now reversed where many of the people that say that they love God hate his law, or they say, we don't need to keep his law, or, or they say that we can change the law. Some, some even say that we can't keep the law. And so it's, uh, it's amazing how Satan can work on both sides of the seesaw, seesaw in sense of one, telling people 
okay, love the law, but don't apply it in a way and really don't keep the law. Or you can say you love God, but you can hate the law of God, which doesn't make any sense. Let's go to the next <laughs> slide. So what are the 10 commandments? It's a little bit of an um, eye chart, but I'm sure we can read it. Christian, can you read it for us, please? The 10 commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verse two through 17. It's on the screen as well. All right. Thou shalt, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven or, above, or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the Father upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto them, thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor any, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day, and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his uh, donkey, <clears throat> nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Thank you very much. So, did the Ten Commandments exist before God wrote them? on the tables of stone on Mount Sinai. Sister Rula, did you have your hand up? Or were you just adjusting the um, camera? I was adjusting the camera, sorry. Okay, no problem. Would you mind reading the verse for us though, while you're speaking? Sure. Genesis 26, five, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Thank you very much. Um, I had a little glitch in my Wi-Fi, so hopefully that came through for everyone else. So one of the principal arguments, so again, we're talking about the law of God. And while there are some Christians that believe in the law of God and believe that the law in God should be kept by faith through grace, um, there's some that don't want to acknowledge the claims of the law upon their lives. So one argument that they give, they say, well, the law was really given to the Jews or that the law didn't exist before Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. or can't be true because when Cain killed Abel, in Genesis, what just Genesis four, chapter four, that was a sin. And 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 God told Cain that that was a sin for him to kill his brother. So for someone to say, well, the law didn't exist before Mount Sinai, that would then mean that, like I said, Cain and um, that Abel Abel's death by the hand of Cain wasn't a sin, or when. Um, God destroyed the world by a worldwide flood that's detailed in Genesis chapter six. Um, that wasn't based on sin, which of course the Bible says it was. So it doesn't make any sense. But here's just another verse that indicates that Abraham, who was of course before Mount Sinai, kept God's commandments, his statutes and his laws, and God commended him for doing that. Any comment before we go to the next slide? I just, I wanted to make a comment. Um, 
and it, I think it kind of just encompasses the first three questions. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe I'm off because I, I didn't look at it. I was just listening. But I think sometimes um, in the society that we live in, we want to just contribute everything good that happens in our life that is from God. And then sometimes we'll say everything bad that happens in our life is from God too as well. But I think it's easier, we don't really realize, and I, I think it was the second question, is that, you know, that we are going to go through some trials and tribulations when we, even though we believe in God and we have faith in God, and even though we find our peace in him. Amen. 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 Yes. Um, I was listening to uh, one of our pastors answer some questions as an answer question and answer session. And one of the questions had to do with um, what role Satan plays in this world. And the answer was that according to the Bible, that Satan is the ruler of this world. He's not the owner of this world. Mm. He's, not, he's not the creator of this world. But he's the ruler of this world. Mm. And he, he got that rulership by, because Adam willfully chose to sin, which means to, chose to follow him and Eve as well. And so that dominion that Adam and Eve had was given to Satan and he's held it ever since. Now, of course, Christ has bought back this world and he'll come again to claim it and he'll become the ruler of this world as well. Um, but he's allowing Satan to rule this world for a time to demonstrate to everyone um, what it means to be under his rulership, his being Satan. And we all see it's, it's a complete disaster. <laughs> Things only get okay. worse and worse and worse under, under Satan's um, rulership of this world. But the reason why I mention all that is to say that because we are in a fallen world, we can expect to go through difficult times. It's um, Satan is going to try to make sure that we, as God's people, everyone in general, but specifically God's people go through difficult times. But we know that Christ has said, greater is he that's in us, than he that's in the world. Mm -hmm. So we have hope, we know that we can that God is gonna protect us, just like he protected Job. Um, Satan only did what he did was only through God's permission. So we're grateful whenever we have a day where there's no accident, there's no harm that comes to us. We lay in our own beds in, a, in our warm environment and we're com comfortable, we have food in our bellies. We praise the Lord and know that that's because of his blessing and his protection, mm -hmm. we are able to enjoy that. Yes, Elder Scorts. But here again, when bad things happen to good people, it's not that God is punishing. He is simply allowing it, knowing that the experience that we go through, what we go through, will draw us closer to him. And it may be rather difficult at times. Yes. Um, we, may have a, we may have a study that goes through this in depth. Um, but as, as a preview of that, what I would say is, like you're saying, that when bad things happen in our lives, and I'm, I'm saying things that we don't bring upon ourselves, just, you know, us minding our own business and life, things happen. That God allows these things to take place to develop our characters and to prepare us because if, if God has a choice between us enjoying our time on this earth without <clears throat> spiritual growth and having difficulties in our lives with spiritual growth, he's going to choose the second one because God's ultimate goal is to perfect our characters, to fit us for heaven so that when we come, when he comes to take us home, we're ready. And so what is allowed to take place is all designed to help us to be ready for Christ's second coming. So yes, God has no problem blessing his people. He does a wonderful job at it. But he wants to get us ready 
for heaven. And that's the most important thing. Amen. So how does the Bible define sin? First John 3, 4. Whosoever committed sin transgress, transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Yeah. So there is some cultural engineering going on right now. It's been going on for a long time. And it has to do with what is considered sin, okay? So the Bible is very clear as to what sin is. We read it right here. Sin is the transgression of the law. And sin, the sin of the, to the law they're talking about is the law of God. It's not some man-made arbitrary law. It's the law of God. That's, that is what sin is. Yes, a crime can be breaking a man-made law, and it's, it's not good to commit crimes. But sin is the transgression of God's law. That's what the Bible says. And there's some things that are clearly designated as sin and sinful practices in the Bible that are, is making some people in the world uncomfortable with that definition. They either are practicing these things or they, are, they um, may know someone that's doing it and they don't want to have that sin label on it because everyone knows the sin label is not a good label to have. So cult, the culture is trying to redefine what sin means. What is sin? And some things that the Bible will say is sin. Some people are saying, that's not really sin. And then there's some things that the Bible encourages, encourages us to do, such as to um, preach and teach and to inform people about the, sin, the sins in the Bible and in a loving way and encourage them to go to the sin pardoning savior for cleansing and power to overcome. There's some people that call those, those, that type of activity sin. They'll say that you're not being kind, you're not being loving, um, you're, mm -hmm. you're bullying people. And we know that the Bible is clear as to what is sin. And God has called us to lovingly and truthfully and tactfully to share his truth with others so that they know. Elder Lane. Yes. Why don't you mean one of the most instructive verses in the Bible about sin is right after the Ten Commandments, the people were scared to death with the lightning and thunder. But Moses said to them, you're not, for God has come to prove you that you that his fear may be before your faces that ye not sin and the other uh, uh versions say come to test you come mm -hmm. to prove you mm -hmm. so this is the reason for sin that he, he doesn't want us to sin i think that's a beautiful verse in exodus 2020. yeah exactly the law of god is given to us as a mirror, the Bible says, so that we can see ourselves and we can recognize where we need his help and his cleansing. And not just his cleansing, his overcoming power. And trying to take something that's labeled as a sin in the Bible and then pretend it's not a sin, is not, it's not helping the situation. Yeah. Just like if someone gets shot and you and you pretend as if they didn't get shot and just tell them to put on their clothes like normal and walk around like normal and, and ignore the, the fact that they've been shot, that's not healing them. So we need, we, we need, we need to recognize these things. Yes, Elder Scorts. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard the simple definition or the illustration of sin, S-I-N, when I or the person becomes the very center, the most important thing, then usually that leads to sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sinful activity is, the root of it is selfishness. Mm -hmm. What does the New Testament say about the Ten Commandments? Christian, can you read this for us as well? 
Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just and good. So another thing that's been happening in the world that people are trying to claim that the commandments or the law of God is um, can be discarded. They are out, out of date, out of fashion, um, things that it really doesn't matter. Um, but the Bible says that it's holy. Holy meaning that it's been set aside for holy use is a holy thing. And um, there are not many things in the Bible that are called holy. Because holiness is something that is a divine attribute. And then it's just. Um, you know, it's impossible to have justice without the law because the law tells you whether something is just or not. And of course it's good. And good meaning, if, if it's good, then it's good now. And if you read the read Romans, there's nothing that says that the law is holy, just, and good 100 years ago or 10 years ago or 1,000 years ago. This is a perpetual, it's perpetually holy, perpetually just, perpetually good. So the law of God will always be holy, it will always be just, it will always be good. Any comment before we go to the next slide? All right, well, let's move forward. Were the Ten Commandments given to be a burden for God's people? Ms. Rula, could you read this for us, please? Sure. First John 5, 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Mm -hmm. Grievous. Grievous, yes. Grievous. So, yep. That's the next thing that people say. The people will say, yeah, we know that the law is holy, is just, is good, but it's just so hard for us to keep it. And it's, it's a burden. You know, I, I, they'll, they'll say, I feel burdened, you know, every night when I think about how many times I broke God's law and, you know, almost wish it didn't even exist because I just, I just can't keep it. And if you, go, if you go through all of these things, all of, all of everything that's in this verse is a gift of God. <clears throat> the love of God is a gift from God. We are not naturally, we don't naturally have love for God or the love of God in our hearts. That's a gift. The commandments are a gift from God. God gave these commandments to us as a gift to help us, to guide us. And so if God gives us his love, he also gives us the commandments. He's also going to give us the power to keep his commandments. Amen. All of God's biddings are his enablings. So God is never going to set, put it you in a situation where you can't do what he's told you to do like we said before, with man, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. Yes, Elvis, of um, course. But here again, regardless how many times we have sinned, uh, how many times we've committed, uh, you know, broken the law of God, it's important to keep in mind that God does not reject us. He still loves us. Um, yes. Part of, like we talked about um, last time, part of the sanctification process is God showing us sinful aspects of our life, God giving us, offering us the power to overcome them. We may, there may be some, doesn't have to be, but there may be some falls, slip and falls as we go, but God works with us and he restores us and he encourages us and he gives us a chance. And, you know, like the illustration goes, when, when your baby um, son or daughter is learning to walk and you see them, you know, mm. walking unsteadily and they fall down, you don't scold them for falling down. You them back up, you encourage them, you give them a kiss, you see how much you love them, you tell them to keep going, keep going, keep going. 
And that's what God does through us through the whole sanctification process. He lifts us up. He guides us, helps us to walk with his, by his power, by his grace. And if we slip and fall, he hugs us and gives us a kiss as we come to him in repentance and says, keep going, keep going, keep going. And we do that, God will help us to, will be able to help us to live that life that, that's pleasing to him. Yeah. 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 I was going to make a comment there. I think that um, as we're coming to know Christ, we don't have all the, you know, and we totally surrender our lives. It's easy, you know, to kind of maybe get confused. You know, some of the stuff is when you're, you know, at a certain point in your walk with Christ, do you understand truly how much he's loved you, how, you know, his love was there to pull you out. And sometimes people don't see that right away, but they see it the more they build and develop a relationship with him and study his word. It, mm -hmm. it, that's just not naturally in us to understand that. That's true. That's true. And we grow. That's why we grow in grace. The Bible talks about growing in grace. Amen. We're grateful for it, that God gives us a chance to grow in grace. How do the Ten Commandments provide guidance to believers? Dear, could you read this for us, please? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Yeah. So the law isn't sin. The law helps us to recognize what sin is. <clears throat> Were the Ten Commandments ever abolished or put away? Elder Scorch, could you read this for us, please? In Romans 3.31, <clears throat> it said... Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Yes, which goes to the next thing that some people say. We're going through, we're trying to knock them bit by bit. They say, oh, well, um, I have, I don't need the law of God because I have faith in Jesus. Mm. And the faith of Jesus is, I have faith in Jesus has done for me on the cross. He died for my sins, and that faith um, is, is what I need. So I need to focus on having faith in Jesus Christ. I don't need to focus on the, the law of God because, you know, Christ died for that. And the answer is no, we are supposed to establish the law. And you notice how it says, it didn't say that um, Christ on, by his death on the cross established the law. Nor does it say that on his death on, by the, on the cross that Christ put away the law. It says that we established the law. So as we live now, of course, the law is established in heaven. So it's not as if if we don't establish it, it's not established. But it's, it's saying in the sense of as we live our lives, we need to establish the law of God in our life. In our own sphere of influence, we should uphold the law of God and live the law of God and encourage others to keep the law of God. That's the part that we're called to play. Mm. Did Jesus ever su suggest the 10 commandments would one day become obsolete? Ms. Stacy, could you read this for us, please? Yes. Think that I come to destroy the law or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For ver verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or, or one tither shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Excellent. So, so this goes against another thing, because some people will say, well, the law of God has changed or can be changed. So if, 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 there, if some people who are trying to put away the law of God, if they can't completely disregard the law and say the law, the law of God doesn't matter completely, or when they try that, that fails. The next answer as well, or next, next um, thing that they say as well, maybe hasn't been put away or done away with, but it's been changed. It can be changed. Mm -hmm. And God is very clear 
right here that not one jot, and the jot, I believe, is the dot above the I or the J. That's a jot. Mm -hmm. Or one tittle, which is the line that crosses an F or a T, mm -hmm. shall in no way pass away until all be fulfilled. <clears throat> and it's very clear if someone says, well, the law has been fulfilled, it was fulfilled at the cross. If that was the case, then Christ would have said so, number one. <laughs> All and right. Number two, and number two, it's not going to be fulfilled until everyone is keeping the law. And so the Bible describes those who keep the law of God and which the law is being fulfilled. And fulfilled doesn't mean it's now done. It means it's being completely lived. So it mm -hmm. needs to be lived. And that's what we're called to do is to promote it so it can be lived by grace and by faith. Amen. Any comments? We go up further. Is it that you said it um, fulfilled me lived in the lives of his followers? That's that's good. I don't think people think of it that way. Yeah, fulfilled does mm. not mean done away with. Yeah. Just like when, just like Christ, he was sent to die for our sins. On the cross, he fulfilled that mission. Right? He died for it. He fulfilled that mission. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no Christian that is that's saying when Christ died on the cross, fulfilled his mission, therefore he no longer, his death no longer matters anymore. Mm -hmm. saying, no, it matters. Mm -hmm. So again, God God is, is saying that we need to fulfill this in keeping the law. And it's not going to be destroyed. He didn't come to um, to destroy it, but to fulfill it, meaning to live it out. So we're saying that in the earth made new, the law will still exist and commandments will still exist. Of course, of course. And we'll, we'll, as we continue on, we'll see why that's the case. Are the 10 commandments necessary under the new covenant? Because that's another thing that some people say. They say, oh, well, that was the Ten Commandments for people way back then. But I'm a new covenant Christian. And as a new covenant Christian, I don't need to keep the law. But I have faith. Mm -hmm. not... Okay, so this is in Hebrews, which is in the New Testament, talking about the new covenant. Because he says, I'm going to make it with the house of Israel, which we know that we're all spiritual Israel. If we read Romans chapter 11, we've been grafted in by faith. Also Galatians chapter 2 talks about if we are in Christ with Abraham's seed. So here is the covenant that God has said he's gonna make with the people. Um, Christian, please read this for us. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Yes. So there are many Christians that, again, want to put away the law of God. They like the last part of that verse. They like where it says, I will be, I'll be to them a God. They say, oh, that's great. And we shall be his people. That sounds great. Mm. But what's in the middle about writing the law into our minds and writing them on our hearts, they have a problem with because they don't, they want to put away the law. But again, the most important thing is that God is saying that for us to be part of that covenant, this is the conditions of the covenant, that he's going to write the laws in our minds and write them on our hearts. Mm. <clears throat> Can a person keep the Ten Commandments? That's a question. So someone will say, oh, okay, 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 you guys, the Bible is clear. Uh, it's not been, the law hasn't been done away with, and it, Christ didn't fulfill the law at the cross, so that means we, we don't have to keep it now, and the law is holy, just, and good, and God is going to write this law in our hearts. You know, the Bible is too clear for me to say anything otherwise. All right, but then they'll say as a last-ditch effort, but can I really keep it? Is it really possible for me to keep God's law? These verses help answer that question. Nathaniel, could you read all three verses for us, please?
Okay, sorry, my internet's slow for some reason. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. I didn't really get to hear what you said of what verse I was supposed to read. All three, please. Okay. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. There has no temptation taken you but such as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, and that ye may be able to bear it. Thank you. So now you remember earlier on we said there's some Christians that will say, well, I don't need to keep the law of God because I have faith in Jesus. I have faith in Jesus and what Jesus did. So Galatians chapter two, verse 20 will say, well, if you have law, if you have faith in Jesus, you're going to allow Christ to live in you. So then mm -hmm. the question obviously is, when Christ was living on this earth, did he keep the law of God? Mm -hmm. Because if he didn't keep the law of God, that'd make him a sinner. And if he was a sinner, then he couldn't be a savior. So then they'll say, okay, yes, you did keep the law of God. And say, okay, well, if, if you have faith in Christ, and faith in Christ, as described here, would allow Christ to live in you. It's impossible for Christ to lead us to sin. He's going to lead us to obey the Father. And mm -hmm. what the Father has given us to obey is his Ten Commandments. So, again, whether you look at it from a law standpoint, you look at it from a faith standpoint, Either way, it all points to the same thing, obedience to what God has given us, and God has given us oh, his law to be obeyed. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the second verse is that God is going to work in us to will and do of his good pleasure. So he's going to change us so mm -hmm. that we don't just do his pleasure, his good pleasure, but we also will want to do it. Mm -hmm. and, th and then we know that, like we said before, Satan is the uh, prince of the power of the air, the Bible refers to him as that also the God of this world, because um, there's some people that actually worship him as God in this world. Mm -hmm. But temptations come through Satan, but God is faithful and he won't let us to be tempted beyond what we're able to bear. And mm -hmm. he will give us the ability to overcome and overcoming means keeping his commandments. And doing the right thing because Satan's temptations are all designed to get us to disobey God's commandments. That's his mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. It's just very interesting the excuses that are made. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the because ultimately we just want to say, "Oh, I have faith and wear it like an umbrella," but it should not cost me anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, are people saved by the Ten Commandments? Because again, that's another excuse. They'll say, you guys that talk about the commandments of God, you're legalists, you're mm -hmm. Pharisees, you're trying to make it seem as if we're saved by keeping the commandments when we're saved by grace. And we'll say, we agree. <laughs> we agree. We are saved by grace. But that fact will still lead us to obey. Go ahead, dear. I was going to say, that's the other camp. That's the other ditch that people fall into, the workspace where I can earn myself. And you really can't. Um, but if I keep the law, which, you, you know, through my own works, then I'm earning my salvation. And that's another ditch. One is to do nothing and, and not allow the Lord to lead or sacrifice self. And the other one is to do it yourself. And both are wrong. Mm -hmm. They're wrong. Can you read this for us, dear, while you're speaking? Okay. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not works, lest any man should boast. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we're not saved by keeping the Ten Commandments. In fact, we can't keep the Ten Commandments. And so right. we, are, we are saved by grace through faith, like this verse says. But that faith as it says in, in James, is going to be demonstrated by works. Mm -hmm. And the works that's being referred to is keeping the Ten Commandments. So it all goes back. Uh, the Bible doesn't disagree with itself. <laughs> you take it all mm -hmm. together, and it's very clear that we're not saved by, our, our, by, by keeping the commandments, but as we go through as we are going through the salvation process god will lead us mm -hmm. as christ lives in us he will lead us to keep the commandments because that is what's going to please god the father just like christ kept the god's commandments and pleased the father when he was worth walking on this earth mm -hmm. yes so then grace is a gift from god yeah, and so is salvation a gift mm -hmm. from god mm -hmm. absolutely Elder Lane. Yes, I'm sure all of us may have heard that saying somebody came up with, we don't keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. We keep the Ten Commandments because we are saved. Amen. 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 What should a person do when they break the commandments of God? Again, we talked about the whole sanctification process and while we don't have to sin, it does happen. And so what should be the response if someone is falls into sin, whether they know better or not, what should that person do? Go to the Father. That's right, go to the Father. So Ms. Ruler, could you read these two verses for us, please? Sure. First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 2, 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that you sin not. And if any ma man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. Thank you. Any thoughts before we go to the next slide? I mean, it's it's nice to know that the Father is available. He wants us to come mm -hmm. when we mess up and when we sin. It's not like we have to run away from Him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. And one thing that you know we probably also should do is when we think about the sin that we commit. we should look at it from a couple of different angles. As we are confessing it to the Father, we should look at it from a couple of different angles. One, we can, the natural angle to look at sin is, okay, what did my sin, how did it mess me up right now? So you do something, you, you so for example, someone tells a lie at school and they get caught by their teacher and they get in trouble with the principal. They should confess that sin because they shouldn't yeah. have lied. But they can look at it in the sense of, oh, now I'm in trouble and you know, the principal's gonna call my parents and I'm, I'm gonna be grounded when I get home and fine. There's, there's nothing wrong with thinking about those consequences, but that's not all. Also think about sin in the sense of what does that sin do to Christ? It says that when we sin, we crucify Christ afresh. So as we love Christ, we should say, wow, what I'm doing is hurting you and also hurting your name. Now, of course, when it says crucifying Christ afresh, doesn't mean that Christ is now in heaven hanging on the cross. It's saying that, that it is bringing the rest of that verse says and brings them to open shame. When we mm -hmm. do these things, other people know about them and we bring the reputation of Christ down. 
And we should, we, our goal as Christians is to lift Christ up, not to bring mm -hmm. him down. So we think about that as well. But then we also should think about the fact that when we sin, that actually stunts and retards our spiritual growth. Mm. So we actually lose ground when we sin. Some people think that when they sin, they just stand still. We actually lose spiritual ground when we sin, which we're gonna have to make up. Um, so, we lose that spiritual momentum by doing the right, when we do the right things by doing the wrong thing. So if we think about all these different things that might help us as we really ask the Lord to give us victory and start to hate sin and not just think of it as a inconvenience that we need to confess. Mm. How does a person learn to keep the commandments of God. Nathaniel, can you read this for us, please? Okay. I would like to do thy will. I delight to do thy will. Oh my God. Yeah, that uh, thy law is within my heart. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And so that again goes back to that new covenant that we read about in Hebrews. So that when the law of God is in our hearts, the more we, we keep the law of God by grace, it deepens that impression. We mm -hmm. see the beauty of God's law in our hearts, in our, in our lives, and we want to do more of it. So we learn to keep God's commandments by doing that. You learn by doing, you learn by studying, you learn by praying, you learn by asking God for power and victory. We also learn by actually doing. Yes, Elder Scori. It's important to realize, to remember that sin is the opposite to the character of God, to what God is, and therefore it is so abhorrent to him and should be to us. That's right. That's right. So what is the key to live to living in harmony with God's law? Ms. Stacey, can you read this for us, please? Yes. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Mm. So super simple. If we love God, we keep his commandments. So keeping God's commandments has to start with love for God. And like I said before, that love is a gift. No one naturally loves God. No one naturally loves the law of God. But God can give us that gift to love him, to love his law, to love his way of life, to love righteousness. We just have to ask. And he will give it to us. Amen. So last thing is, are you willing today to invite Jesus to live his perfect life in you and guide you in a life of loving obedience to God. Hopefully um, all of our answers yes, and by God's grace, we can grow and learn and allow the Holy Spirit to write the law of God in our hearts, give us a love for Christ and help us to follow him. Yes, Elder Lane. I love James 1:22. But be you doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Amen. Amen. Following the way of God is not always easy, but the Bible says that the way of the transgressor is hard. Hmm. So if you think about who has a hard life, the hard life are for transgressors and the word transgressors referring to those who are transgressing what? The law of God. And what is transgressing the law of God say? It is sin. So if we follow a path of sin, our way is gonna be very hard. If we follow the way of righteousness, our way may not be easy, but we have Jesus to give us the power and the ability and the desire to do that. So we want to thank the Lord for that and continue to pray that God will change us 
and write his law in our hearts so that we will follow him all the way. So thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next week.